One of the biggest hurdles to overcome when you first start woodworking is to figure out what kind of wood to use for your projects. There's solid wood or plywood, softwood, hardwood, construction grade, domestic, exotic, and not to mention trying to make sense of all the sizes involved. It can be pretty overwhelming. But don't worry, we're going to sort all of that out in this video. And a little later, I'm going to show you a couple of specific projects of mine and the wood I used and why I used it. Simply put, solid wood is cut directly from a tree. It doesn't have any composite materials like MDF or fiberboard, and it doesn't have any layers glued together like plywood. Solid wood is steady and secure, but it does take on and release moisture throughout the year. So if you don't take that movement into account, your project could crack or split. The most widely available solid wood here in the US is known as SPF, spruce pine fir. It can be any of those three species, but you may know it more commonly as a two x four or a two x six. This is construction grade lumber and it can be found at almost any big home center or lumber yard. Spruce pine and firs are conifer trees, which are trees that are generally evergreen and have a cone. Woods that come from conifer trees are known as softwoods. Now I'm not gonna get into this too much, but not not all softwoods are soft, not all hardwoods are hard, but generally that's the case. So as a woodworker, the primary benefit of this construction grade type lumber is the price. It can be very cheap, especially if you need a thicker piece. The so building a table out of SPF from Home Depot is going to cost you about a fourth of what it would cost if you built it out of, say, walnut or cherry. If you go the construction grade lumber route for your project, just make sure they're stamped KD or HT or both. That means kiln dried, heat treated. All the pests have been killed and the actual wood is dry. If you come across something that's labeled AD for air dry or SGRN surface green or something to that effect, that wood is still really wet. I would stay away from it because it's got a lot of shrinking to do as that water evaporates off and that could cause you problems in your project. Go with something that's actually been kiln dried because even though it probably has a little bit more drying to do, it's not near as much as wood that hasn't been kiln dried and it's going to move a lot less. I talked about conifer trees and softwoods a little earlier, now let's talk about deciduous trees. These are trees that lose their leaves in the fall and we call the wood from these trees hardwoods. There are exceptions to this rule, but overall hardwoods are much denser than softwoods. There are a wide variety of hardwoods, but for the sake of this video, I'm just going to go with two categories, domestic and exotic. Domestics are anything that grow in your region. So here in the U.S., that would be woods like walnut, cherry, maple, oak. Exotics are anything that grows somewhere else and have to be imported into your area. So here in the U.S., that would be things like wenge, zebra wood, sapele, yellow heart, purple heart, things like that. Your ability to find these different woods depends on where you are. I'm in the southern United States, so if I go to Lowe's or Home Depot, besides construction grade lumber, they've got red oak, poplar, and a really nice pine. There's no other domestics, and they don't have any exotics. So if I want something else, I have to go to the lumber mill, which I do 99% of the time, or someplace like Woodcraft, who also has a selection of different exotics and domestics. You can also order online, so even though you can't see every piece and put your hands on it and match grain before you buy it, it's becoming increasingly popular. Just about every woodworker or DIYer is going to have this moment questioning their sanity where they see the size on a piece of wood, but when they've gone to work with it, they realize, I'm missing half an inch. And who knows exactly where this comes from, but I would guess that it's probably from when they first cut that piece of wood it's likely two inches by four inches, but going through the milling process to get it flat and smooth and square, they've taken some of its size down. And when you go to buy lumber in a lumber yard, it gets even worse. They refer to size in quarters and board feet. If you see boards labeled four quarter or four over four, those are one inch thick since four quarters equals one. So six quarter is an inch and a half thick, eight quarters is two inches thick and so on. But before you get too excited, those numbers are also nominal. A four quarter board that's supposed to be an inch thick is actually about 13 sixteenths of an inch thick. 
When you go to pay at the lumber yard, this is something that even experienced woodworkers struggle with, but especially beginners. The lumber industry has something called board feet, and it's the length times the width times the thickness, and then that gets divided by 144. So you take that number, and then you've got a price that's set per board foot for, say, walnut, and if it's 350 a board foot, you take that answer times 350, and that's the price of the board. But don't sweat all this, and definitely don't let it deter you from going to a lumber yard, because honestly, that's where the great prices are, the great selection, and you're really going to miss out if you avoid lumber yards. Just don't hesitate to ask the questions that you have. If you don't understand board feet, ask them to explain how they're measuring, how they're calculating. And every time you go, you're a little bit more experienced and knowledgeable than the last time. Materials like plywood, MDF, and fiberboard can either be thin layers of wood glued together, or they can be some sort of composite material that may or may not have actual wood in it. These materials can be great for projects like cabinets where you need wide surfaces because they come in 4x8 sheets, where solid wood you'd have to glue pieces together to get the width you need. All of these have the added benefit of little to no movement during the seasons as water is absorbed and evaporated. MDF and fiberboard have virtually no movement. Plywood will just a little bit because they are real wood layers, but they're so thin and they're stacked in alternating directions that the overall movement is hardly noticeable. The drawback to all these materials is that they're not near as strong and won't last near as long as solid wood. And generally, traditional joinery methods like mortise and tenons are pretty worthless to attempt, so don't bother. I mentioned briefly before that plywood is a stack of thin layers of wood that are turned in different grain directions and then glued together. Plywood gets graded, and part of that grade is based off of what each side looks like, or each face. If it's smooth and blemish free and has a really nice appearance, that's a higher quality face. If it's got a bunch of knots or it's repeating pattern or it looks more like construction grade lumber, then that's a lower quality face. And you can get plywood in any combination of good or bad faces or both bad or both good. So recently I did a project where I bought mostly plywood with a good side and a bad side because only one side would show. And then I had just two pieces that were going to show both sides, so I bought higher quality plywood for that. There are a lot of different types of plywood that have different applications. Things such as OSB, which is just layers of wood that are stacked and glued on each other in a certain way and it creates a plywood panel. I would never use that for something like a furniture project or even a shop project where the OSB would show in the end. It's more in my opinion for construction type applications where it's going to be hidden. On the same hand, I wouldn't personally use an expensive plywood for something that's going to take a beating. There's also plywoods that live in that middle area that aren't too expensive but also still look pretty nice and one of those is radiata pine. It's about 60% the price of a sheet of oak plywood, so quite a bit less expensive, but it looks way better than OSB. And you can actually make a pretty nice finished project if you pick through the pile a little bit and get a nice sheet. Just most of the time, the other side is going to be pretty rough with knots and repeating patterns and look have more of a construction look, so you're most of the time going to have to be able to hide that side in your project. One big consideration, especially with MDF and to a lesser degree plywood, is that they don't like water at all. Plywood can be resistant to weather as long as you keep water out of the ends where the actual layers are exposed. So most of the time you'd put a solid wood banding all around the edges to hide that and then also just like any other wood put a finish on there to resist water as much as possible. Logs can be cut in several different ways. The first way we're going to talk about is plain sawn or flat sawn. That is where the grain is parallel to the face. If we take a board here, this grain runs parallel to the faces, the top face and the bottom face. This is the cheapest way for a sawyer to mill a log since he gets the most wood from the tree. Another way to flat saw is to make passes down to the top of the pith and then roll the log over do the same thing down to the pith and do that all the way around. But the problem is it's by far the most unstable and the boards can cup and twist easily. Most of the boards you find at the home center are flat sawn with knots, cathedrals, and an unstable shape. A sawyer can also quarter saw this log. He'll cut it up into four sections or four quarters and a lot of times, but not all the time, They'll cut a slab directly out of the middle to get rid of this pith. Once this is quartered, one piece at a time will go up on the mill. It'll make a pass, roll it over, make a pass, roll it over, make a pass. And if you see this grain is 
almost 90 degrees to 60 degrees either way to the face. This results in a much more secure and stable board. The grain is a lot straighter. And then if you have medullary rays that come out from the center, which I don't think this log does, then the ray flex will show up on the face of the board. There is more waste cutting it this way compared to flat sawing, so quarter sawing is more expensive. The last one I'll talk about is riff sawing. That's when the sawyer's trying to get boards that are oriented so that the grain is 30 to 60 degrees to the face. They really want to get it as close to 45 degrees to the face as they can. And this results in the absolute straightest, cleanest grain. Because there's so much waste with a rifts on log, it's much more expensive to buy these types of boards compared to quarter sawn or flat sawn. But we talked about the pros and cons of construction grade lumber earlier. If one advantage is the affordability, then the downside has to be the difficulty in building with it because the majority of it is flat sawn and it's so unstable and it cups and it twists. The first project I'm going to show you is this balustrade coffee table that I built several years ago. To keep the cost down, I used all construction grade lumber for this table except for the balusters which were ordered just as they are. The tabletop is 2x6s. These little pieces on the top and bottom of the balusters are also 2x6s. And then the base is 2x4s pocket screwed together with 1x6s laying on top of that. Now if you've seen the video I did on the balustrade coffee table, this is obviously not that one. This is the first one I ever built of this style and I actually messed up in a couple of different ways. The first thing I would say is that I would never recommend painting a table like this white because it gets way too much traffic, it's very hard to keep it clean and it stains very easily. Secondly, the 2x6s I used to build this were really wet and I really didn't know enough to pay attention to that back then. They've cupped very badly in places, there's some cracking going on, and even though the breadboard ends were cut correctly with space on each side for contraction and expansion, these just had way too much drying to do and so they've caused issues. If you look at the end piece, normally you will see a lip here because of the nature of how these are expanding. Wood expands across its grain, so this end piece is going to expand this way and all of the middle part is going to expand this way. So you would expect in the winter time that the middle part would contract and shrink and that you would have a little bit of an overhang here. The problem is this was so wet that it contracted and contracted and this lip is always here and in the winter time it just gets much worse. You can successfully use construction grade lumber to build a table like this, no problem. Since this table, I've built two more out of the exact same type of lumber that I just made sure was dry and I built it in the right way. And those tables are going on several years and they look great. So just make sure your wood is kiln dried, build your project right, accounting for wood movement and you won't have a problem. This project is a cabinet on stand I built for one of my daughters a few years ago and is based off a plan by Mike Pekovic. I wanted this to be an heirloom quality piece that she could keep for a long time and eventually pass down. So I made it out of really nice hardwood. It's mainly hard maple and then it's got purple heart accents. And the rainbow on the front is made out of all exotic wood, Paduke, Red Heart, Yellow Heart, and Purple Heart. You'll know from earlier in this video that if you see cathedrals like this and some of this grain pattern here, the start of some tree limbs, things like that, you'll know that those are flat sawn pieces. But if you look at the top rail of the door, you see that that is fairly straight grain and then also the back is fairly straight, so that's a quarter sawn piece of wood. These pieces of Purple Heart, really straight grain on the faces, and on the edges, those are quarter sawn purple heart. The legs are close to two inches by two inches, and if you'll notice, they've got two sides that are really straight grain and then two sides that are flat sawn grain. And if you look at the ends, they've got a basic rift sawn orientation, but on the opposite orientation, it looks close to flat sawn, and that's why we get this grain pattern. The last project I'm going to show you are these bookcases and cubbies that I built. There's a lot of surface area here, so this was a perfect opportunity to use plywood and that made it a lot cheaper. And because I didn't want the plywood ends to show, I cut strips of solid wood and glued them to the front. And then in the back, I could have used the same plywood that I used for the rest of the cabinet, but instead I chose this really cheap fiber board and it worked great. I know this video was packed with a lot of information, so if you've got a question, put it down in the comments. If I can't answer it or somebody else in the community, then we'll find the answer somehow. Also, if I left something out or you don't quite agree with something I said, put that down in the comments. If this video helps you out, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.